Mesdames et messieurs, bonjour. Euh, merci infiniment d'être si nombreux. Euh, je suis en fait, nous sommes bien conscients de la chaleur de la salle et veuillez nous en excuser. Donc, euh, euh, nous n'allons pas manquer à régler ce problème. Euh, donc, aujourd'hui, dans le cadre de la semaine culturelle d'Ispan à Paris, euh, je pense que c'est notre quatrième jour et nous sommes vraiment euh, ravis de vous voir si nombreux. Donc, euh, euh, nous allons parler aujourd'hui euh, des jardins. Euh, voilà, donc euh, nous avons l'honneur d'avoir la présence de M. Kosravi, euh, qui, M. Kosravi est architecte, il a fait ses études, vous me corrigez si je me trompe, euh, à, il a fait ses études à l'université de Téhéran et puis euh, maintenant il, est, euh, il, a, il a fait euh, un, son doctorat à, à, à l'école d'architecture de Delft et donc là où il, est, où, il, où il enseigne actuellement, donc M. Rossavi a déjà eu plusieurs publications sur, la, sur les jardins persans, sur les villes iraniens et je tiens à noter tout particulièrement son dernier livre Inhabitable, euh, in, euh, je ne sais pas comment le traduire, Inhabitable Worlds euh, en français, son dernier livre sur euh, la ville de Téhéran qui est vraiment, je vous invite vraiment à à, à lire ce livre qui est un des livres les plus intéressants sur la ville, non seulement sur la ville de Téhéran mais aussi sur la ville iranienne et sur beaucoup d'autres choses euh, donc je tiens à remercier M. Kosravi pour sa présence et puis on va enchaîner par la suite avec une intervention de Mme Mahfash Alemi qui vient de Rome et puis on s'enchaînera avec Mme Moafi donc je ne manquerai pas à vous présenter euh, ces intervenants par la suite. Merci infiniment et désolé euh, encore pour la chaleur. Euh, je vais tout de suite essayer une solution, de trouver une solution. Voilà, merci. Euh, et, et puis en fait la présentation, euh, ça sera en anglais, donc euh, j'espère que euh, en fait, étant, étant euh, nous, puisque nous sommes dans un cadre universitaire, donc euh, s'il est tout à fait normal que cette présentation aussi soit en, en anglais. Après, si vous avez besoin d'une euh, traduction, je, nous serons aussi ici. Euh, on va régler le problème aussi. Voilà. Thank you, Sina. Good afternoon. Um, I have to apologize for two things. First, keeping you here while there's a great weather outside. And also, secondly, because of the deformed slides, which I cannot do anything with it. Perhaps it's something wrong with, uh, with the projector. So all the eclipses that you're going to see are supposed to be circles. All the, square, all the rectangles are squares, basically. So try to imagine and bear with me. Is, is there really strange to have this problem in the School of Architecture, basically. Uh, good afternoon. I'm very happy to be, be, to be with you here and in this beautiful venue. Uh, firstly, I would like to thank uh, the organizers of these events the whole week, um, and also specifically to Sina, Sina Abedi, who invited me uh, to have a talk within these great panels, uh, along with uh, my friends and colleagues, Mafa Shalemi and Samane uh, Moafi. As Sina introduced, uh, just quickly, I'm Hamed Khosravi. Uh, I'm a lecturer at the Faculty of Architecture at the TU Delft in Netherlands, and uh, which I'm there I'm running and coordinating a lab uh, which is called Transitional Territories. Uh, today, within the framework of the theme of Gardens of Isfahan, I would like to put forward a thesis, basically. Uh, not exclusively limited to, to the case of Esfahan uh, and its garden, but rather perhaps a reading um, of a specific urban form, that, which I would call it inhabitable walls. I would try to elaborate on this concept um, as a meeting point of architecture, power, and territory, uh, based on which the structure of most of the Iranian cities, um, including Esfahan, can be theorized, basically. To do so, I would revisit the idea of radical settlement. And by that, I mean I'm referring to extreme political, social, uh, environmental, and ecological conditions within which particular forms of architecture and urban form and tectonics, as well as subjectivity, can emerge. 
Uh, our discussion today uh, would rest on the footing of a long-term research that I've been developing during uh, past years to explore the, found the political foundation of the idea of city in a region loosely identified as Middle East. By political, of course, I'm not referring to daily politics or parliamentary politics. I'm addressing a particular definition of the idea of political, which is perhaps best described by the German jurist and philosopher Karl Schmidt. Uh, during 1920s in his book, uh, The Concept of the Political. Schmidt defines the idea political in a distinction between opposed entities and opposed forces, uh, and in particular, friend and enemy. His reading, of course, is uh, founded on Hobbes's philosophy uh, and is the idea of a state as a sovereign body, a dichotomy between imperial forces and insurgent movements or more conceptually speaking, state as representation of static and stabilizing forces and movement as flows, flows of goods, materials, information, and capital. In this regard, I would like to refer to two statements uh, taken from two contemporary philosophers. First by Giorgio Agamben. Voila. Um, as he writes, the state is a static and legal element, whilst the movement is expansion of dynamic forces of society. So the movement is always social and in antagonism with the state, and it expresses the dynamic primacy of society over juridical and state institutions. And second, from Deleuze and Gattari, when they describe the performance of the state as the state operates through the capture of movement and partitioning of the, of the space. And I recall this back towards the end of the presentation, and perhaps this could be much more unfolded back then. That said, I would like to propose a dialectical reading uh, of the idea of urban form based on a relationship between norm and exception, inclusion and exclusion, static and nomadic forces. Following that, I would like to stress on a constructive dynamism of these opposing forces and entities uh, that could possibly shape or motivate uh, a creative tension. Let's call it conflicts here. This could be read as a driving force of shaping cities, architecture, and its collective subjectivity. With this introduction, uh, we can perhaps go through a few case studies. Uh, in the landscape of uh, Central Asia and large Iranian plateau, uh, the original form of life has been always nomadism, which uh, with a bit of generalization, we can expand this geographical condition somewhere from a stretch from uh, Indian Peninsula to North Africa. Of course, there are many things in between. But within this geographical condition, uh, the life of the nomad, uh, in the life of the nomad, daily activities are act of survival. And any life, any form of life is an ideal life. Each aspect of life uh, is a right protected and conducted by a spirit or God. And a house or a tent in this case uh, is a special manifestation of these rights protecting and regulating every life's form and habit. Thus, for early nomadic societies, the ideological aspects of house had particular meaning. A permanent settlement was an exceptional structure, a sacred enclosure, wherein life was carefully choreographed by sequence of spaces and rituals. And in order to, get, uh, to have it protected and also to let it proliferate from within an impossible condition in this case. These two buildings are two examples that I would like to elaborate a bit. Uh, they've been taken from the larger Iranian plateau. The right one uh, is located now today in, within the border of Turkmenistan. They are far away from each other, around 1,000 kilometers. The left one is uh, towards the south uh, in the Iranian border, but close to the border with, with uh, Pakistan in the southeast part of the country. Both cases are taken from Bronze Age, uh, roughly 500 BC. And they're identified by archaeologists as domestic spaces. However, there are few features in these buildings um, that demonstrates a more complex use of space, like, for example, the fire altar in the middle of the courtyard, uh, or some open spaces, especially in the left one, 
which in a way implies some sort of collective use. Archaeologists concluded that in both cases, uh, the space had been accommodating specific rituals um, and collective activities. However, they had maintained their domestic function too. In a way, we can say that the notion of sacred and domesticity were literally merged uh, in the tectonic of these architectures. However, by later development of cities and the rise of sovereign state, the notion of sacred became separate from the domestic life and was possessed by the state power. The result was reposition of temple as a monumental building where the same spatial configuration of uh, those nomadic houses and those early settlements were employed in construction of the tectonic of this monumental building. In fact, the temple were the same uh, origin in, in the same original nomad's houses in terms of organization of space. Nevertheless, beyond the state's appropriation of space, the life of the nomad existed in a constant movement. It's been, it had been kept in a vital balance between the ever-changing environment outside and external forces. The harmony could have been achieved through an extensive control and management of those forces and natural resources. Such a performance required a high level of flexibility and resilience, which existed in a contrast with the rigid and static boundaries set and imposed by the state. Indeed, the interaction between the opposing forces was, an absolute, was not for an absolute dominance over one another, but rather was for an establishment and existential relationship between them that drove and supported the nomadic life and the state forces alike. To rearticulate it simply, frames and boundaries that were set by the state provided protection and a form of association to the power and to the territory, while they imposed a degree of exclusion and isolation at the same time. On the other hand, the dwellers of these inhabitable frames kept resisting being neutralized within the rigid boundaries, and however they enjoyed the temporary security that allowed them to establish a form of collective body to resist and to go beyond these structures. In other words, the rigid boundaries would drive formations of rituals and therefore collective subjectivity. This form of life have been always existed in a permanent state of conflict. Historically, this process has directly affected the ways in which space has been organized and architectural form has been developed. For nomads, the ideal form of living was only possible through a collective and communal life. The political significance of communal life reveals itself when it is in the contrast and opposition to the stabilizing forces of state or environment. Settlements, therefore, settlements of those um, uh, nomadic lives presupposes a land of appropriation and a spatial definition, materialized in frames, borders, and boundaries, which historically these orders followed two different spatial and juridical paradigms. There were to tame and to protect the subject and the landscape in order to make life possible and then to create the possibility of a collective body and collective subjectivity, which I would call it in this presentation, frames and protocols. Architecturally, this spatial paradigm is very reduced to simple grids of infrastructure, both above the ground and underground, that frame the subject and territorialize them and put them in relationship with the territory and power. Here we can see the, the map of one of the early cities in the Islamic period, uh, the city of Kufa, which is a uh, place in the very proximity to the Iranian border, and back then was in fact a uh, Persian uh, empire, um, founded in seventh century. Uh, the bodies and families are literally put in a specific layout and in relationship to each other. The whole city is divided in four neighborhoods. Each neighborhood has its own squares in the center, and there are families and uh, tribes that are allocated in each of these squares, which in fact, this was a model developed based on the concept of Medina. Medina is one of the most explicit and at the same time concrete development of the spatial appropriation that we talked about, that was employed and rearticulated at the rise of the Islamic empire when Islamic ideology reconstructed the concept of city. As emerged within the nomadic society in the Arabian Peninsula, the Islamic faith is oriented towards the community, 
The effect of this orientation is translated into a very unique and peculiar concept of Omma, a literally community of faithful. At the beginning of the formation of the Islamic empire, uh, in a very political move, I would say, uh, the concept of Omma was instrumentalized to mobilize the nomadic forces and to redefine the, their relationship with land in a way in an opposition to a concept of nation as we know it. The idea was to re-territorialize the mobile uh, nomads in specific places in the territory and to give them a coherent spatial and social order, as we saw in the case of the city of Kufa. The model of Medina was then used as a spatial organization framing political body of the new state. Then what is Medina? I'm sure that you've heard about it and mostly in relation to the, let's say, core or historic part of the Arabic or uh, Middle Eastern city. But perhaps it could be defined as an archetypical model of settlement. Etymologically, Medina is derived from a routine, which in uh, Aramaic language uh, is a stand as a non, which, which, uh, which means law and as a verb to rule. In a very exclusive occurrence, it can appear as the idea of political. This is borrowed in Hebrew and Arabic languages and expressed into two fundamental words, din as judgment and law, and Medina as the city. However, in the Persian language, it has another meaning, which is from Indo-European roots. Uh, din stands for religion. There is an interesting exchange uh, among these three, let's say, meanings of the word in Arabic, Hebrew, and Persian language that encompasses the three ideas of the political, religion, and law. They are bound together in, in marking the core concept of the particular settlements that is political by definition. Simply the term renders an ideological power defined within a territorial dimension. This particular concept is best embodied in this etching perhaps uh, done by Kircher, uh, a fam famous geographer in the 17th century, depicting the terrestrial paradise, a territory captured within the hostile environment of the Persian plateau, framed by a crisp wall, guarded by four angels, and manifesting an ideal form of living, literally paradise, in contrast with, to the concept, uh, in contrast to the context we're in placed. One of the first examples, perhaps, and the most explicit application uh, of the idea of Medina, recapturing the idea of Medina at the early Islamic state was done actually by Muhammad himself and his companion in the year 622, when they immigrated from Mecca to a new place to set a new state of uh, the Islamic state. They built a permanent house for the Prophet and his family. It later became known as the House of Muhammad or Mosque of Muhammad. The structure was simply a squared plan of 100 cubits each side, surrounded by a wall of seven cubits high around this perimeter. They built a roofed structure, partly supported by two rows of columns, first to the northern part, where the play, uh, prayer can take place and the communal meeting uh, could be hosted. By the time of changing the direction of Qibla, uh, this uh, columned hall was moved to the south part. A row of typical houses, which for me is quite important, start shaping around and outside the wall, starting from two, two rooms or two chambers for Muhammad and uh, his families, and then expanded around it uh, to accommodate his, his companion. During the life of Muhammad, it never functioned as a temple, this structure. However, following the death, uh, his death, when they buried his, his corpse in one of the chambers, the house became a sanctuary. And the hypostyle hall was extended to accommodate more people. The formal aspects of the house of Muhammad served, in a way, as a model for mosques as well as cities in, in the early Islamic period. There is a delicate transi trans transition between the sacredness of body here and the sacredness of space. Uh, in this case, uh, the corpse of Muhammad and his companion and the sacredness of the space as we, space that we know later as a mosque. 
against the controversial understanding of the sacredness of a void as, uh, let's say, an empty space that can reflect the idea of a sky and a celestial dimension, perhaps it's the inhabitable structure that ac accommodating the sacred bodies that became the sacred space. In a way, the, body, the sacredness of the body of faithful and its subjectivities give the sacredness and the, and the subjectivity to the space. As we could see it here, this accommodating the, uh, the faithful bodies has been really a case in the mosque of Esfahan and its evolution. The way that it grows and it encaptures various forms of collectivity through architectural tectonic. As you might know, that establishment of this, monk, this mosque during the eighth, mid eighth century was a kind of benchmark for shaping a new structure for the city of Isfahan that probably you'll be uh, lectured uh, about it later today or in the, in the upcoming events. We could say that Medina was a prototypical space shaped out of inhabitable enclosures that exclusively marked the core political body of the Islamic State in this case and gave it a territorial dimension. By reflecting a divine order, the enclosures was uh, to create a microcosmos recapitulating the collective organization of the subjects. Almost all the historical settlements in the region had followed the same spatial organization. Fields of inhabitable walls punctuating the barren territory. In this case, we are seeing uh, the plan of a famous mosque of some era, perhaps you can recognize it or you can remember it from its uh, iconic spiral minaret. But in this case, I would like to reflect on the plan. Here we are seeing not the plan of the mosque itself, but the extended and expanded plan, which includes uh, the recent, relatively recent archeological foundings around it, which shows the mosque itself was not limited to the core and the prayer hall, but in fact was incorporating into a city, uh, including series of houses, uh, single units and multiple units around it as integral part of the structure. Carefully designed and laid out and controlled by the state and higher power here. The limited historical account that describes the foundation of such cities makes clear that the ideological power was directly um, in applied in planning and construction of these structures and cities. Uh, there is an interesting test, text uh, in the history of Al Tabari uh, that describes the foundation of another city, in this case, Baghdad. Uh, the capital of Islamic city, Islamic empire in 762. Uh, I would like to read you uh, phrases of this, uh, it, this text which describes how influential was the, the imposition of ideological power in shaping the tectonic of the city. Well, and Mansur decided to build it. He wanted to behold it with his own eyes. So he ordered it to be drawn with ashes on the ground. He began to enter from each gates and walked through all the passageways, all the arcades, and the courtyards, which they were all drawing in ashes. And he turned around and looked at the man and at the plan of the city. Having done that, he ordered that the cotton seeds be poured on those lines and the oil be poured on them. And he gazed at it as the fire was, gla was blazing up. This, thus he understood the plan of the city and came to know its design. In a way, he literally made a one-to-one -one, three-dimensional rendering of the whole city that he designed, uh, and he walked through each of the corners. Quite a dramatic scene. Of course, uh, inhabitable frames uh, were not invented by the Islamic State and had existed long before in the territory of the Central Asia and larger Iranian plateau. As you know, this territory is historically known as the main concentration of caravan routes uh, linking the east to the west. They were, the way in which the territory of caravan's route were marked was through a very particular architectural type, typology, or, di or spatial device, let's call it, uh, known as caravan sarai. If the Medina was connoting an ideological and political dimension of the urban form, uh, there is another term that defines the tectonic and spatial features of this kind of settlements, Sarai, which is, we have it in the Caravan Sarai as well. It derived from the Indo-European root, uh, Thera, 
uh, that stands for bound space. Uh, for example, we have the word serrato in Italian coming from uh, the same root, which, is, which means closed, closed space. Serai became suffix in definition of fundamental characteristics of spaces such as carbon serai. Caro army here and serai bounded space and therefore carbon serai stands for military camp. Carbon serai was a building that extruded a true dimensional diagram of settlements. Was an inhabitable enclosure, inhabitable wall, enclosing a central void. The outer wall uh, was built in an almost uninterrupted way, allowing access through only a controllable and easily uh, manageable portal. Open arcades run along uh, the central courtyard and the perimeter, uh, and the, in the middle of each side, perhaps we can see uh, more prominent rooms. Uh, in this case, we can see it here, here and there. And around the four corners of uh, the Karvansara, usually they put exceptional functions. Uh, kitchen, prayer room, bathhouses, or mosques, or a uh, cistern at some point. Karvansara were, shape, uh, were shaping spatial configuration of the core idea of settlements within this barren landscape that we talk about. Uh, before, way before, re-articulation of the concept of Medina in, by the Islamic Empire. In fact, Karvansarai were war machines, equipped with all the function necessi functional necessities which became the living wall framing the collective subject and protect them uh, from the external forces, as well as to define and control a landscape, a territory. There is again a sense of ideal associated with the form of settlements, the form of spatial organization historically conceived as terrestrial paradise. If Medina and Karwansarai, uh, the ideal uh, space materialized through archetypical form, the next paradigm that I would like to talk about is a formless one, uh, which is about organization and management of the territory. Beyond common association with leisure and agriculture, uh, Persian gardens were the only spatial configurations, wherein any form of life was possible. Uh, they were, in fact, life-sustaining camps within the literal tabula rasa of the Iranian plateau. If inhabitable walls are spatial devices manifesting the tectonic aspects of a city or urban form, the garden represents a managerial apparatus, measuring and appropriating life on Earth. Gardens in Persian territory were always behind a wall. On outside, we have desert and the harsh reality of life. The most common space, spatial organization of these gardens, as you will know, perhaps, is Charbagh, which literally means four garden, um, a quadrant structure where uh, a rectangle is divided in four uh, by two streams of water which meeting each other at the center. There is no particular reference uh, on vegetation or plant in the original definition of gardens, and in all about the walled piece of land greeted and supported by water channels. That's why I really like this image. Uh, more than being a planted space, the garden determined a territorial organization based on a pattern of water distribution. It's not only a protected walled space, but also its end point of series of hydrological, mechanical, and engineering uh, on a territorial scale that to tame and to uh, the harsh environment around it and to make the land Livable. The most shared features of this uh, territory, of course, that we are talking about is scarcity of water and the existence of any forms of life and any habitation is fully dependent of availability of surface water. Historically, the, the inhabitants of this land use water channel through a special uh, characteristics and mechanics, which is known as kanat, uh, which is in fact a subterranean aqueduct, let's put it this way, which by gravity and through a gently sloping channels, bringing the water from the foot of mountain to the place which later will be developed as a form of habitation. This operation on a territorial scale requires a very careful understanding of topography, geology, and even geological construction that requires a territorial survey 
of the land. In fact, any kind of settlement in this region, uh, in, this, uh, in this region is supported by this uh, infrastructure, subterranean infrastructure, provided prior to the moment of its foundation. The garden were outposts of this underground infrastructure. Their forms were intimately related to their functions. The spatial configuration of the garden, the grid and its size and its direction were all calculated based on a measure based calculated and measured based on the amount of water that can be extracted from the underground water channels and can be distributed to land. In other words, more than being an archetypical space, garden represents a series of spatial protocols and measures that were needed to sustain life in such a territory. In this way, Persian gardens were, were indexes of the cities. Construction of these urban artifacts required performance of a powerful executive authority that can run such a project on a territorial and regional scale. Like camps, garden, or state apparatuses. Having seen this, uh, these two paradigms, we can recall again Deleuze and Gattari's quotation here that describes the performance of the space, uh, the form, performance of the state. The state operates through capture of movement and partitioning of the space. In both paradigms, the frames and the protocols. By capturing the movement and giving them static structure, the state establishes a dialectical relationship with the nomadic forces. Could it be faithful bodies, uh, companions of Muhammad, caravans, routes, crossing the desert, nomads, economic flows, or even water? Isfahan is a paradigmatic city within this uh, theory and thesis that epitomizes this spatial political concept theory uh, throughout its long history. In one of the early descriptions of the city, uh, Ibn Rusta, the Persian geographer, describes it as the full uh, representation of the concept of Medina, implying a confined urban form uh, that is enclosed within walls, whose origin dates, dates back to the Sassanid era. A description that conceptually confirms socio-spatial uniqueness of the city as a center of ideological power, whether it be uh, Zoroastrian Judaism, Christianism, or Islam later. In another description, a few years later, uh, Muqaddasi, the Arab geographer, praises the city as a land of paradise. It could be said that the foundation of the city has tied firmly into capturing the territorial movement and partitioning the space into an enclosed, autonomous, and protected entity within the harsh environment. This notion becomes much clearer when we move to history and we arrive to the moment that Isfahan became the capital of the Safavid Empire, uh, put forward a project by the great Shah Abbas, when during 1590s, he reestablished his empire and his state by recreating the city through the very elements discussed before, inhabitable walls and gardens, namely Maidan Naqsha Jahan, a famous uh, attraction point in the city and Charbagh Boulevard. I'm sure that you will be introduced much depth, much in depth about this history and these particular elements of the city. But I would like to, uh, to finish my talk by extrapolating from this case and going back, reflecting on the theoretical departure point that we started with. And this reading, the space, is an immediate product of the very tension. The walls of Medina, or grids of garden, became state apparatuses in re-establishing re the relationship between the subject, power, and the territory. The city became, in a way, the result of the performance of a political state over a given land, not only shaping to a particular urban form, but creating a specific subjectivity. And by further expansion of the cities, these artifacts that we talked about, frames and gardens, became part of the city fabric. However, they remained as exceptional forms that gave birth to another or new forms of architectural typology. More than simply being historical phenomena, these two paradigms offer a way through which uh, the idea of the city could be read, not anymore through a direct imposition of imperial forces, but through a dialectical power relationship. In this way, the architecture serves as a frame or walls, enabling and accommodating a perpetual conflict, deliberately giving rise to a condition of confrontation and separation. By furnishing a territory using Bernard Cash's work, 
The inhabitable walls, they capture the movement, partition the space, and control the ever-changing environment around it, creating a form of exclusion that let various forms of life flourish within these bounded frames. And at the same time, activates the possibility of resistance can go beyond it. Thank you.